Today we have two special guests. We have one of our very own information science PhD students, and we have Dr. Norman Howden. And Dr. Howden did work at UNT in the past, so it's nice to have him back. So let me introduce him. Um, Dr. Norman Howden is an academic information specialist who recently retired. Congratulations. Um, after directing the library at El Centro Community College, his educational background includes degrees from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and from Case, West, Case Western Reserve University. He has served as founding director of a marine science library at LSU, and I'm particularly interested in hearing about that. That sounds fascinating. Uh, he taught at Louisiana State University, the University of North Texas, and the University of Missouri. His interests include applying new technology, library operations and organization, and library safety. He directed and installed the first LAN, is that how you say it, LAN, not L-A-N? Okay, LAN in the library school at UNT. Over the years, he has worked with acquisition and operation of local area networks, pay for print solutions, email systems, and electronic database resources. Most recently, he was the key instigator to move Dallas College into implementing a learning commons concept, something many of us are familiar with these days, right? Most universities are trying to work on that now. Um, so welcome, Dr. Howden. And as we know, the guest who's being interviewed can also be just as important as the interviewer. And today we have uh, Ruchi Shawade from the Information Science Department. Ruchi is an international student from India. She has experience being a journalist back there before she moved to the US for graduate school in 2018. She graduated with a master's degree in journalism in 2020 and is now a third year, P is it still third year, Ruchi? Yes. Yes, okay, third year PhD student, time flies, you never know, <laughs> uh, at the interdisciplinary program where here at the College of Information and her concentration is in journalism. Let's welcome Ruchi and Dr. Howden, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. And with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. I recommend that you all put your um, your mode, your view mode in speaker mode so that you can pretend you're sitting watching two people have an interview, maybe on a sofa. All right, take it away. Awesome. So uh, Dr. Howden, first of all, I would like to thank you for you know being here with us today and answering some of our questions. So, um, your most recent position was with uh, El Centro College Library, like which is part of Dallas uh, Dallas County Community College, where you also worked for over like 26 years and retired recently as assistant dean, right? And regional mentor. So what role did you play as an assistant dean and what led you into this career? Well, to answer that first, that last question first, what led me into this career was that... Uh, Prior to coming into library school, I was working as an Air Force officer at Bowling Field in Andrew in uh, DC. And I spent a year being tossed into a project to start a real time information system in my area and had to go through training, learn what computers were all about in many ways because they were still very new at that time and not everybody came with that background, but I went to the library and boned up. Um, and moving into this position with El Centro was kind of a bit of luck, you know? Um, I had a colleague who had lost a director recently and wanted was actually helping the search process a little bit. And the entire library team at that time in the college was looking for a new automated library system. And it happened that I met with them at ALA and traipsed around with them the whole meeting looking at integrated online systems. They wanted to move from notice to a more real time system. And so uh, I helped with that process, took notes, looked at the options for the different systems. And I was just finishing a one year contract at the University of Missouri. So it was very timely. and. Uh, we worked together and I shortly at the end of my term moved back to uh, Dallas um, and took on the role. I moved very slowly in rank at that time, but I started as a full-time worker, um, 
and took the role of being director, even though I didn't formally have that position yet. Um, there's a lot that goes into that role in a community college, and that includes uh, managing a facility, administering systems, troubleshooting technology, budgeting, uh, collection development, furnishings, uh, security, um, administering branch libraries. Mm -hmm. And twice we had grant funds to upgrade our technology. And I was one of the co-directors of one of those grants. So right. a lot of interesting opportunities. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and you were also instrumental in moving the Dallas College towards a learning commons concept. Can you explain your vision for that initiative? Like, how did you know it was the right move? Well, at that, at that time, we were in the process of starting into moving Dallas College from seven accredited institutions to one accredited institution. Mm -hmm. And in the process, it was decided to centralize the institution, which, of course, helped economically and at the start of COVID was most timely. Um, it did result in a lot of layoffs, especially at mm, middle management level, more than anything. Um, the whole purpose of the learning commons that appealed to the library directors, though, when they proposed it, is that it's a one-stop shop for students yes. so that they can get everything they need. Uh, tutoring, library, computer lab in one place with all the specialists to help them. Now, there are a wide variety of learning common implementations, and some of them include things like uh, advising in particular. Right. Um, we did a, a total study on that, walked every library and learning commons area that would be included on all seven campuses. I wore out a set of legs that week. Um, but we got everybody involved, all the people in automation, the people in the libraries, the people in tutoring. And these days, the tutoring people are very much part of the whole system. Um, we already had one library that had integrated that way physically, and that was Eastfield, because as you can well imagine, in almost any large organization, space is at a premium. And when that campus got crunched, right. they moved to a learning commons. Mm, got it. And we so were already doing a lot of cooperative programming. Okay, okay. Particularly with tutoring, mm -hmm. because one of the things that impacted us about five years ago mm -hmm. was dual credit, and that needed a lot of support. Oh, okay. Interesting. So you also worked at um smu right in the business information center at cox school of business as an information specialist so what background or experience did you have i mean i know you mentioned that you were in the air force so how did that uh you know prepare you for this role and i mean how can students in a library or information science program prepare themselves for this type of work so what do you see as the challenges or rewards for working in a special library? Well, at SMU, of course, we were strictly in the business school. Mm -hmm. And the things in my background that helped more than anything were teaching experience okay. and a knack for technology, because I put their first web pages up even back before we had mm -hmm. uh, really good software for it. Mm -hmm. um, my background in the military may have applied a little bit because I was an aircraft maintenance officer. Uh, so I had some knack for dealing with uh, subjects that are outside the bounds of the humanities, let us say, uh, technology, uh, engineering, that kind of thing. Um, but the thing that helps a lot in a business library is an entrepreneurial spirit and beginning to acquire a subject knowledge in business. Mm -hmm. um, you really, in a special library, have to play many roles, and you should reach out to IT and be well aware and friends with those folks because they can make or break a lot of what you do. Uh, the te technology present in the uh, Business Information Center at, at SMU is phenomenal. 
Uh, they have one whole learning lab that's devoted, for instance, to Bloomberg terminals, which are very expensive terminals for accessing uh, market conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you also need to be willing to reach out to users right. and uh, tackle different roles and changes. That library was totally changed during the time that I was there. And by that, I mean, they stripped the library down to the bare concrete and mm. replaced everything in it. Oh my God, that sounds like a daunting task. It was, it was interesting. Well, mm -hmm. it's a newer, brighter, and a lot more fun place. Yes. They have uh, all their computers set up to be PCs, but they can also emulate an Apple. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. And you also directed, uh, you directed and installed the first local area network in the library school at UNT. So can you also describe that experience and the importance of initiating and following through on that pro project? Sure. Um, that was the first year that I was at uh, mm -hmm. UNT. Mm -hmm. And technology had already moved a bit because when I was working at LSU, we'd already gotten into local mm -hmm. area networks mm -hmm. and we knew it was something we needed. For instance, that gives everyone in the unit access to a laser printer, which these days is common, but in those days were brand new. And so um, I was very happy because our dean went over to the graduate school and talked them out of $50,000, mm -hmm. gave it to me. And what I did was to get a load release for teaching by mm -hmm. convening a seminar that included both uh, masters and doctoral students, mm -hmm. about eight to 10 of them, I don't remember the exact number. And I gave them a few lectures about the technology. And then I tasked them with specifying mm -hmm. and purchasing and installing all the components for the network, which they did. They went out and got the Novell red boxes, purchased them, went into Dallas to pick them up, uh, brought them home, put them together with a, a double server, uh, hooked it to the, the uh, campus network, mm -hmm. ran coax cabling to all the offices. They had a lot of fun. So was this like a part of your assistant professorship at UNT in the 80s and 90s? Yes, that seminar was something that was part of my teaching load. Oh, wow. And so um, the thing that did happen, though, was that I ended up doing a lot more training than I was uh, work, <laughs> as I was expecting, because, for instance, we implemented WordPerfect on the network. Right. And I was answering questions about WordPerfect for years, literally. Mm -hmm. what, okay. That's it. So what all courses, what other courses did you teach? I taught microcomputers and libraries, online database systems, special libraries, mm -hmm. science and technology literature, information systems analysis. Mm -hmm. And early on programming, we taught basic for a while. Oh, okay. And how do you think that specifically prepared students for a career in information and library science? And what has changed since that time and how students need to prepare? Well, I think that students are often shaped by their advisors and uh, should be very critical of what their advisors suggest. But I think that a lot of the technology is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, technology has professionalized over the last couple of year, dozen years. So you are dealing with other professionals who have their own way of doing things, and it's good to know that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that librarians these days need to, and information professionals across the board, mm -hmm. need to have some awareness of organizational behavior and have the ability to teach others because we may understand a great deal about information systems, information distribution, but not yeah. everybody else does. And it helps to go back and be aware of the history, the, the, uh, the way in which information has been stored and used in the past and the way that has transitioned into mm -hmm. electronic systems. Right. And I also noticed that you were 
also the program director in a coastal information repository at the Center for Wetland Resources at LSU. And like this seems really fascinating. So can you share some of, uh, you know, some stories of how you applied your library skills to this position? Sure. That was kind of interesting because they needed a library. They had four information units. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, I went to ALA, interviewed people for the position, mm -hmm. came home, and after a week's notice, they decided that they wanted me to direct the program, which transitioned me out of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, it was an interesting operation because we started out with almost no technology. We had to buy uh, technology for ourselves. We had a unique budget because it was granted to the, the Center for Wetland Resources directly from the legislature. It did not go through the university budget, um, which also made it somewhat vulnerable. But uh, we built our own databases. We had software to use very sophisticated search engine that would give us, you know, full Boolean operator access to our data. Uh, right. We made our own microfilms to store documents that we did not want to lose. Uh, we had map data. We had a data tape library mm -hmm. with a programmer and a data librarian. And our programmer also served as a statistician. One of the unique things about that unit was that since our budget was ours and unique, mm -hmm. we could farm ourselves out to the research grant Right. groups within the organization mm -hmm. and take the salary that we saved and mm -hmm. move that into buying technology, which we did. We quickly moved from uh, really early microcomputers into, st into systems that attached to the mainframe, did away mm -hmm. with card punches and moved to online data entry, which is much more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we had our unique moments. I mean, a couple. one unique moment was that as we expanded into new technology, somebody without thinking mm -hmm. gave the facilities department the responsibility for running data cables, which they did. Mm -hmm. And they put cable on ends on that were made for home TVs, which were not compatible and they were not properly put on. So they promptly fell off until they finally decided that IT might have a part in that process. Yeah. And then uh, we had a lot of good Cajun food because we were near the water, a lot mm -hmm. of fish. We had tremendous parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, we contracted our databases out to the Department of Natural Resources because we put together several databases about right. water management topics. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then there was that notable moment because we were in the upper floor mm -hmm. of the Military Sciences Building. And one morning... Somebody had invited a guest who brought a 50 caliber machine gun full of blanks and proceeded to fire it off in the firing range right under us. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like a, having a library with a machine gun going off. Right. Yeah. But uh, we had a lot of fun. I, that was probably the greatest fun I've had. Five years going to other Marine centers. Uh -huh. learning what they did and participating in the Marine Science Professional Organization, which is IAMSLIC, I-A-M-S-L-I-C. The title okay. for that was probably put together on a bar. <laughs> I am slick. Oh, sorry. No worries. And well, before we move on, uh, you know, from your vast experience, is there any other job like other than teaching and being the aircraft maintenance officer like are there any other jobs that you that you uh you know talk like are there any other stories um i've had some interesting experiences mm -hmm. looking at the need for other libraries uh, in the military when i was still a master's student the military asked me to look at an organization that needed a library for scientists, and I spent the time putting together a staff report to recommend solutions. Yeah. Um, of course, at LSU, we put the Information Center together for marine science. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a survey for the park cities here in Dallas. 
<laughs> to support their need for a public library, amazingly enough. And we did a full community survey to support that. Mm -hmm. And I also spent time for a year as mm -hmm. a consultant. And yeah. uh, I think that's important to remember that there are other facets outside of institutional libraries. There's an right. industry that supports libraries. There are consultants. Mm -hmm. I think if you bridge into those areas, being a consultant or working for a vendor, mm -hmm. you do need to keep your credentials current right. and your networks intact. Right. Awesome. And you also published a manual for libraries on local area networking for small libraries. Was that the one in Dallas that you did? I did that while I was at UNT, yes. Okay, okay. And, um, so can you describe uh, what we can expect to learn from it? Uh, of course, a lot of the information is very basic at this point because technology has moved ahead. But okay. it's important to learn that technology is a resource and mm -hmm. that you know you can engage with people doing technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to read the manual and tech notes that go with right. everything. Um, one of our other professors at UNT and I spent an interesting day mm -hmm. trying to set up a um, digital data projector until the departmental secretary came in and said, look, boys, has everyone read the manual? And we said, oh, but... <laughs> No, no, read the manual because there are many things that you can do if you right. understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and these days you need to choose your battles. One of the things going on in a lot of libraries is a move from box computers that have CD drives and hard mm -hmm. drives to thin right. clients. That's, that whole thing is a wave going across Dallas College right now. Mm -hmm. It's much more efficient but you need to think in terms of what do you need in the library? For instance, do you need a computer that has a CD drive because you have a circulating CD collection? Mm -hmm. Or do you need it in case the system goes down because thin clients depend upon a remote server that may be 10 miles away? Right. You need to know what happens when the power goes out. That's Whether true. You have power standby, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think it's uh, really important to think through how your technology exists and how it works. Right on. So, I mean, lastly, what advice uh, would you, you know, give to students who either want to work in community college libraries or, uh, you know, uh, the special type of libraries and, you know, like what professional organizations should they join at the beginning of their careers? Sure. Well, um, I've done a fair number of, of uh, roles in different professional organizations. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to choose at least one, preferably the primary one that best matches your current position. Mm -hmm. And look around and think about the opportunities to take leadership training if you have none because there are a lot of choices. There are tall Texans here in Texas. Mm -hmm. There's the Harvard Institute, which I've intended, which is very nice mm -hmm. uh, and is supported by uh, ALA okay. and uh, Disney, but also look in the local community. Local communities have mm -hmm. leadership programs mm -hmm. and your institution does. For instance, Dallas College has a leadership program, which right your supervisor can release you to and gives you great opportunities to network. Right. Also, as you move through your career, just starting out, choose mm -hmm. to do things like scheduling, budgeting, right. surveys, mm -hmm. or work with a consultant part-time mm -hmm. to do projects or work independently. And think about facets within your organization. For instance, in community colleges, you might choose to do some institutional effectiveness, which gives you great span. Mm -hmm. And on that same note, if you have the extra 16 hours in another discipline, then right. information science, that gives you the opportunity to teach. And since right. you do, are unlikely to have a tenure position, mm -hmm. being a faculty member, even part-time, gives you great entree with the faculty 
they know that you teach, that you understand their role and mm -hmm. their problems because you learn how student systems operate, mm -hmm. what the deadlines are for getting grades in, things that you know are onerous to faculty and you understand their role just a little bit better. Right on. I'd also say, don't place yourself in one job and realize that you're gonna stay there forever unless you're in a small community and for family or personal reasons, you don't intend to move mm -hmm. because all of us move between positions. Yeah. And if we can, we move across state lines, nationally, sometimes internationally. Mm -hmm. And one last word I'd leave you with. Remember that libraries are businesses. Uh, what the library contributes to the mission or the bottom line is incredibly important. And you need to be able to demonstrate that. Awesome. Amazing. Okay. Well, it sounds like we've gotten already some good advice from Dr. Howden. Was that your last question, Ruchi? Yeah, I just had like one more additional question. Okay, go right ahead. So, Dr. Howden, I mean... I was really fascinated to know that you were an aircraft maintenance officer because I myself at one point considered, uh, you know, commercial aviation as a career option mm -hmm. when I was a lot younger. I just wanted to know how did that experience uh, help you with teaching? Well, you uh, teaching? Yeah. In some ways, mm -hmm. you know, going into the military certainly pulls you out of yourself a good deal. Mm -hmm. And the last role I had was in a staff position at a major air command over at Bowling Field. Um, it gives you a great deal of confidence, probably more than I should have had going into library school, but I had just spent a year and a half, two years, getting up every morning at you know 5 a.m., being at work at 6.30, and going and briefing the general. Good morning, sir, the status of the aircraft is. Um, but beyond that, a lot of thinking outside the box because in aircraft maintenance, you have all kinds of unusual situations. I spent a year at Budapau in Thailand. I spent a year in Northern Maine, and then finally time in uh, DC, plus the fact that I had been a military dependent all my life. Oh. So yeah, it gives you a lot of different perspective, but certainly the engineering side. And I think it contributed a lot to the way I look at library and information science in terms that uh, I really want us to serve all of our constituents. There are blind spots. A lot of libraries look at the student going through our institutions and think, well, if they come into the library, we'll take care of them. Well, certainly COVID blew that out of the water. And certainly there are blind spots we have. If we have people that are in trades, say construction management mm -hmm. or uh, fire or police, they may come into the library occasionally, but the, the uh, faculty may not bring them in for library instruction. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't put together a live guide for those disciplines. And I found that particularly, for instance, with computing, the faculty have a lot of information they want to convey that, that is outside the, the exact borders of what they're teaching. But they were willing to contribute a lot of material and online links to build library guides, which brings their students into the online environment of the library. And I think reaching out to people in those disciplines that don't use the library regularly is really important to build bridges and know that every student needs information, but you can't just sit there and expect them to walk through the door. Right. And uh, I'll add an anecdote, speaking of live guides. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of fun when COVID hit because we quickly checked out all the computers and uh, hot spots that we had and got more. But the school was facing a real problem because we began to realize that we could have students back on campus if they were socially distanced. Well, it just happened that the people who put live guides together came out with a module at that moment, which allowed scheduling. 
scheduling right down to the level of a particular chair in the library or other area. And over a few weeks, the libraries at DC ended up scheduling for four, 16 different departments, some of which involved training their staff to use the scheduling software. But in many ways, we really saved the day that with that. The fact that we had two librarians who just about devoted their entire professional time to keeping that software up, but it allowed us to have students come on back to campus. Yeah. Okay. And and the the moral of the story is that librarians should run the world. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Or at least know the software you're using and all of the technical resources don't be limited by what you have on the deck right now look at all the facets think what we can do that's not there excellent so a lot of our students um, who are studying the masters of library science program or masters of information science program right now um, do are looking for specific information about you know how can i prepare myself if i want to have a job in a community college library or if i want to work in an academic library and of course you've given us lots of ideas but are there any other specific steps they should be taking in addition to their program of course um if you can choose a, an internship mm -hmm. um, there are community colleges that are quite happy to pay you during an internship and uh I'm sorry if the faculty frown on that sometimes. There are a few faculty who do, but I firmly believe that if you're doing an internship, by golly, you should be able to be paid. Um, I think that uh, you can do yourself a great credit by enlarging your uh, academic data. If, as I said before, if you can add uh, the 16 hours of graduate school that allows you to teach another discipline, you know, you could teach history, you could teach math, you can teach whatever most interests you, but that gives you entree to being there. But also be aware that in a community college, you tend to do a bit of everything. Yeah. You do reference, you do collection development, you do outreach, you do student over the shoulder instruction, you do online, uh, you do everything. And, uh, Sometimes it gets way beyond. Uh, one thing I can share is that uh, you remember that El Centro College was uh, the focus of a shooting in 2016. Five police officers died. They blew the culprit up 30 feet from my office. We were out of our offices for six weeks. The FBI tore through there and collected evidence. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I was deeply involved in emergency management with the city of Dallas, teaching training courses for civilians, um, the CERT program, Community Emergency Response Team, and the college had an internal response team. And that became quite a deal because being downtown, unlike some campuses, we had several layers of security because we had hired security people who basically checked people in and out of the building. And there was one at every single entrance. We had commissioned police officers who were responsible for not only the college, but since they were commissioned an equivalent to Dallas police, they covered an area out to a thousand feet beyond the buildings. We had three police forces, our police, Dallas police and dark police. So a very reasonably secure environment but nonetheless it's something that just happened it's something that involved us and um, it's certainly the kind of thing that you don't know will walk across your page uh, i certainly was very involved in two different accreditation programs at el centro uh, was involved in actually conveying the process uh, spent my time standing in front of the faculty and staff and uh, leading them through part of the process, uh, putting together the final documents that the visiting committee used. So there are roles that you can play and often are quickly pulled into, and certainly accreditation is a big one. And 
you know, there are librarians who cross that line and become institutional effectiveness officers, particularly if they have decent talents with statistics. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat and um, this particular questioner, Dr. Lund, he apologizes that if the question had already been answered because he's had barking dogs and he's been in and out, but I believe that we can get a new angle on this question. He asked about your activity in professional organizations. We touched on that a little bit, but you didn't specifically state what you had done if you'd been active in any of them and which ones did you find the most value in for advancing your career? Um, I, I think that in many ways, the most important part is building a network. And certainly, uh, I've had fun. I mean, I've certainly been lucky enough to be in leadership positions. I've served, uh, chaired an RASD subcommittee and, and others within ALA. Uh, I've chaired the Texas chapter of ACES. Um, and I had one year that I almost killed myself because I was chair of uh, the uh, Texas Association that, that is all the academic libraries in the state at the same time that I was chairing one of the uh, TLA uh, regions. And that totally uh, kept me busy organizing meetings. But the fact that uh, Professional organizations are happy to have you and your time gives you entree and certainly um, they will let you lead programs, lead uh, projects. I've certainly done projects uh, with, with the um, marine science, for instance, I put together uh, uh, shared resources for them. Um, I've edited a column for TLA uh, those give you exposure and just contributing, doing book reviews, um, finding other ways in institutions give you some visibility and it's the networking that really counts. So it sounds like those things can also lead to improving your CV, which you mentioned before, you know, you can put those, those types of yeah. activities on your CV, even yeah. if they're a lot of work, but don't over, overdo it. It sounds like maybe you're a word of caution Absolutely. there. <laughs> and think about the connections that you make, because it's not that it will lead to a job necessarily. But when you're in our profession, you occasionally need to ask questions. What's everybody else doing? Uh, how do I get started with this project? Uh, those connections can be crucial at some point. Okay. All right. And Ruchi had another question. Go ahead, Ruchi. Uh, Dr. Howden, can you share some uh other special types of libraries that students might be able to, uh, to specialize in? Well, there are many types. Certainly there are newspaper libraries, there are industry libraries. I mean, Frito-Lay has a library. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve has a library. Um, the number of special libraries is enormous. And it, of course, the Special Libraries Association encompasses uh, for-profit librarians who set up uh, their own shop and do specialized searching and help for industry. And there are a lot of industries where maintaining a library may not be feasible, but they can come to a consultant shop and get a project done. And a lot of academic libraries have something to do that. For instance, at LSU, there is a shop there that industry and business can come to and get a search done without having to have a full-time library. I certainly had a lot of fun at UNT because for a while we had a contract with IBM and it just worked out perfectly that for a couple of years, uh, we supported their site library uh, and it, it was nicely done where uh, master students could work in that library and once they completed the core courses, they got a payroll bump, bump, and uh, doctoral students were tasked with leading that group. And it just happened that after about uh, six months into the program, the person who was the site librarian departed for another profession and left one of our doctoral students in charge. And that was kind of fun. Interesting. Um, Lance has a question in the chat. 
Uh, he wrote, you mentioned several studies and surveys that you've performed in the past. What were some of the more interesting ones? And what are some of the details and approaches to those studies and surveys that help the most in developing strategies to actualizing the needed results? Uh, well, the one that I probably mentioned the most was doing that Park City survey here in Dallas. And uh, a community survey is intended to do one thing, which is to justify a millage increase in taxes because you're competing with everyone else who wants tax money, the roads, the trash collection department, everybody, the police are part of that budget process that you're competing for. So they really need strong community support. And uh, we certainly provided results that were successful. A lot of the other surveys that I've used have been with software in the college because there's a constant need not only to do surveys for the library occasionally, and every three or four years, it's good to survey and know what the faculty are thinking in particular, but um, it's also part of things like uh, SACS accreditation. Any accreditation wants to know that you are keeping up with what's going on in the organization. Lance, I think we're, am I the only one who's having a hard time hearing him, understanding him? No, I'm having a hard time understanding Okay. Him. Lance, you seem to have a problem, a little bit of a problem with your mic or your sound. If you want to follow up in the chat with what you were just saying. Not really. No. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead and follow up in the chat if you can uh, with what you wanted to say. We'd, we'd love to hear your follow up. And uh, while we're waiting for, for Lance, if he wants to try to write something in the chat, um, I did have a question about mentoring. You know, you and I had kind of discussed back and forth, yeah. Dr. Howden, just about how important mentoring is. And I'm not sure how many of you know, but we have started a college level mentoring program in the name of Dr. Yvonne Chandler. I think you know that, right, Norman? You you did have a connection to her, correct? Indeed. Okay. Do you want to speak a little bit about that and then also perhaps touch on the importance of joining some kind of mentoring program? Well, of course, I'd like to point out that she met me one Saturday as I was cruising through Denton with my wife, and we stopped to greet uh, her, and she served us some fresh breakfast mimosas. But uh, yes, she was a, a, a trooper, knew everything about everyone from here to Atlanta, and uh, shared a great deal and kept me on track when I was going through some personal problems. Uh, and now for, I've forgotten the question. Do you want to speak to the, I know it's, you know, thinking about her probably brings up emotions and memories, yes. But um, I know that she was a big advocate of mentoring and pretty much everyone yes. she met became her mentee to some extent. So. What would you like to say to the students about um, the importance of finding a mentor or even later being a mentor? It, it's important if you can find the right mentor who has a focus on things that you're familiar with and need to learn. Um, but there are many shades of mentoring. It may be that you'd like to, to have someone that you can meet formally with at a professional meeting or over coffee in your area if they're, in, if they're local. But it's also possible to have um, a constellation of people that you're networked with, that you know how, what their particular value is, what their skills and focus is, and can ring them up, which may mean just emailing them occasionally to ask a crucial question, especially if you move into new technology or if your organization is changing in some way. And... You also have mentors that you acquire when you go through training. Those programs that I suggested might be useful for leadership are great places to build a network. And I certainly have kept up with a lot of people from those programs, knowing that a lot of them are moving into leadership positions and have interesting war stories, uh, 
skills that they can share, moments that really matter, that when you learn how they dealt with them, move you along as well. Um, and there's plenty of peer mentoring. Certainly, uh, I think that when I was teaching and when I've directed the library, the peer group that you're with does a lot to help shape what can happen for you. So be aware that those people are resources that you may make friends with them, but also think about them and learn from them. Be actively engaged to know them as people and what their professional focus is. Thank you. And I see that um, the link to the Dr. Yvonne J. Chandler Mentorship Program has been put in the chat. Thank you, Sandy. Um, the, the application for students to apply for the spring semester is not open yet, but it'll be open on December 1st. And But the, we are accepting applications right now for mentors. And of course, we our students benefit so much from anyone who signs up to be a mentor. Um, and Lance has a follow-up question. I'm so glad you did, Lance. I was worried you, you know, had given up. Um, he says he took a course on surveys in his MBA. And did you find it difficult in developing useful and accurate surveys and questions? Um, sometimes it takes a little bit of, of uh, thinking things through and asking other people, but uh, there are some excellent uh, both textbooks and courses that, that do cover uh, surveys. It's important to have the experience of asking others to look over your surveys. And we have really nice software available these days for doing surveys, whether it's a professional survey software or something you pull out of Google, there are plenty of them. Um, it's really good to be aware of the, the very exact nature you phrase the questions. No two ways about that. And to make sure that the answers you get are something that can be compiled because you can ask questions and when you compile them, who knows? Uh, did you zero in on something that actually will give you information? It's important to look at what you want before you put the question together. You look at your outcomes and work back from that. That's probably the most important focus you can have doing a survey. I'd love to follow that up with my non-professional opinion on surveys. <laughs> As a person who gets surveyed a lot, I think it's the questions, like you said, it, they're so it's so important that they be um, pinpointed to what you really want to find out. And then also, you know, survey fatigue is a real thing. So just be careful not to make a lot too long of a survey with too many detailed questions. That's my opinion on surveys. I don't know if what do you think, Dr. Howden? Yeah. And a lot, you encounter a lot of surveys. For instance, uh, in the academic library area in Texas, the uh, leadership group and the directors do a survey every year of technology to see how technology is changing. Uh, we've gone through some great seasons. A lot of it, you know, 10, 15 years ago was changing to public printing processes. Now it's thin clients and it may be something else on the horizon, but finding out what's going on, who is implemented and how far along it's they're going, what the budget impact is, how users are adapting is important. And uh, sharing that information gives you the perspective you need to, to make changes locally. I noticed in the chat too that um, back to the mentoring uh, topic, James mentioned that LISA, L-I-S-S-A, right? That's the library organization um, has a mentorship program. And I'm curious, James, to know how it compares to the college level mentoring program. The Dr. Yvonne J. Chandler mentorship program connects current students or new grads with alumni working in the field that they're interested in going into. And thank you, Sandy, for dropping that in the chat. Um, what about the LISA one, James? Do you want to unmic and tell us what, what kind of mentor, you know, who are the people involved in this relationship? Oh, maybe James dropped his knowledge and left. I'm not sure. 
I don't see him in there anymore in the in the group. Does anyone uh has anyone joined the Lissa mentorship? Oh, he's asking, can you hear me? No, we can't hear you, James. Wanna I see you. I see your mic is off, but I don't hear you. Maybe you can. Oh, okay, he's paired with a UNT librarian is what he's saying. So that's somebody working in the field, right, James? That's uh, that's a perfect mentor to have somebody. And did you you want to be an academic librarian in the future? Ah, yeah. Okay. So he sounds like he has a good mentor. So it's always good, you know. I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Howden, but I think you can't have too many mentors. Uh, that's true. And I certainly feel very much that library directors and library supervisors, it's part of your role. Uh, certainly, I've been very happy in the last few years at El Centro, I was happy to have one librarian complete a master's in history, and another librarian went back and took courses to become qualified as a medical librarian. We need those additional skills, and uh, it's foolish to think that uh, mentorship is unnecessary. It, everyone needs it, and um, you know it's it's really part of your management style. You should your staff should be moving ahead, and that means a lot in terms of how open you are in a leadership role. Do you share some of the details of the budget? Is everybody's load balanced for acquisitions? You can't move away from having a lot of hands-on perspective as a library leader. Yes, and these days, you know, there's always things that trend in and trend out. Um, sometimes we have buzzwords like, oh, mentorship, this is a big deal right now. But I've been in the, you know, in the academic world for 24 years, and it has been important from the beginning to the end so even though it seems these days like everyone's like oh we have a mentoring program that's great that's it's not a trend it's here to stay okay and we have a few more minutes it's 11 54 we might have a time for one or two more questions if you can get them put in the chat or if you want to unmic and ask your question assuming you have good audio we haven't had very good luck with the audio today Well, let me say in the interlude that uh, it's certainly been an honor to be here, but I'd also say that if anyone wants some advice or just general chat, um, I'm always available. Uh, you have my email address. I'm happy to share that. Um, and these days being retired, I actually have time to do things. <laughs> yeah, it is nice, right, to have a little extra time. Um, not be so stretched. So do you mind if we go ahead and drop your email in the chat then? No, not at all. Go ahead. All right. And maybe Adam can take care of that for me. Well, I can do it directly. Adam got it in the chat. He's the fastest. Oh. <laughs> as soon as I start to put anything in the chat, it's there. Yeah. So thank you, Adam. Any last minute questions for Dr. Howden? I'd like to thank Ruchi for being here today to do the interview. Um, go ahead, Ruchi. <laughs> um, I mean, like, um, is there anything else that you would like to share, which, you know, maybe I didn't touch upon or anyone else didn't touch upon any extra anecdotes from your amazing life experience? No, I, I, I certainly have to say that I have been very lucky in the profession. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, and uh, while I deal with technology and have dealt with that as a primary focus a lot, I understand everyone has a different focus, and that's what makes the profession very rich. Academic libraries depend on that. Uh, yeah. When I was doing my master's work, I was lucky. I ended up be doing my internship in the engineering library. Uh, but those internships 
can help shape what you do. Look around, see who has something interesting that you can do. And know that we're in Dallas. We've got a lot of interesting libraries out there. We've got great professional groups. Uh, it's a very rich environment. So certainly dig in and find out what you really want to do. And that's a great way to end the interview because um, I'd like to just remind all of our students that are here present that we do post job openings and internship openings whenever we get them on um, our hand on Handshake. The Career Center posts them on Handshake. We also post them on our LinkedIn page, the COI community page. Maybe Sandy or Adam could drop that link in the chat if they have a moment. Um, we encourage you. There's There are internships, like you said, Dr. Howden, there's internships op opening up all the time, and we share them. And, and yes, some of them are unpaid, um, but luckily the UNT does offer an unpaid internship scholarship that you can apply for that's $1,000. It's a new thing. Yep, it's a new Great. thing. Um, so th thank you so much, Dr. Howden and Ruchi, for being here today. It was a fascinating interview. I learned a lot. I enjoyed everything I listened to, and I hope everyone else feels the same way. Let's give them a, a thank you round of applause. <laughs>